Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Idaho Falls Symphony. My name is Thomas Heuser. I'm your music director. And welcome to the 72nd season of the Idaho Falls Symphony, a season we're calling Reconnect. We are delighted to be back with a full orchestra in the concert hall, and we apologize for the delay in the return of in-person audiences, but as you know, gathering large groups is still very complicated, and we are hopeful that as the season goes along, we will be able to bring you back to hear live performances of the Idaho Falls Symphony. But for now, we remain virtual, and we are taking advantage of all that we learned last year in our 71st season that was entirely virtual. And so here we are in our pre-concert mode, getting ready to hear the music of the symphony played once again, but broadcast live online in a, in a new format. So we're continuing to adapt and evolve. This is my opportunity in a pre-concert talk to connect with the audiences in the hall right before we go on stage. So instead of that opportunity, I'm here in my hotel room and coming to you live in this format. And if only we were together again, but we will be soon. And I so enjoy these opportunities to be able to explain a little bit about the composers on this evening's program and also about the musical selections themselves. This concert on October 9th that's coming up Saturday night is called New Beginnings and it is the Pink Ribbon Concert, an annual event at the Idaho Falls Symphony sponsored by Mountain View Hospital. This is in recognition of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is an incredibly important message for all of us at the Idaho Falls Symphony family. What we have for you are three wonderful works and an incredible guest artist on this program. We are, of course, back with the full symphony orchestra in the hall, and that gives us the opportunity to move away from what we were doing last year with the small ensembles and individual recordings and all of the things that we were doing to stay solvent and stay connected with you uh, during what I guess we're calling now the first year of the global pandemic. But we now have the full orchestra back, and it is a thrill to hear the sounds of this uh, full ensemble once again, especially our friends in the Winds and Brass who had a, almost a complete year of absence, uh, except for the, the online offerings that some of them were able to produce. So it's a thrill to be back and we're so excited. This program gets started with the music of Ludwig von Beethoven, his Coriolan Overture. Beethoven was born in 1770, and as you may remember, we were celebrating his 250th anniversary in 2020, would have been uh, an incredible performance of his ninth symphony uh, in April of 2020, and that was unfortunately canceled. We hope to bring it back uh, in the coming seasons, of course, because we could probably play Beethoven's ninth every season. It's a wonderful um, exploration of all of sort of humanity gathered into this one piece. But for tonight and on October 9th, uh, when you're able to enjoy this broadcast, we have the Coriolan Overture, which dates from 1807. It, by the time this piece had been written, Beethoven had already more or less secured himself a place in music history as an incredible composer and incredible performer. A concert pianist, he had debuted his five piano concertos and had already had success with his first, second, third symphonies. And of course, the third symphony marks sort of a turning point. His Eroica symphony marks the beginning of what is called his middle period or the heroic period. And this Coriolan overture also belongs to that heroic period. Beethoven, of course, born in Bonn, Germany, but by this time he had made a success in Vienna and he had moved to Vienna and was part of the salon culture and the concert culture in Vienna at the time, which was an incredibly competitive but also prestigious environment uh, with a number of very important patrons of the arts uh, who were supporting Beethoven in all of his efforts, both as a, a performer and a composer. And so this Coriolan Overture has that heroicism built in. The story uh, by Heinrich von Collen, uh, the Coriolan play, Beethoven wrote this music as incidental music to the play Coriolanus. And the, the music, the overture that we have here is just one of several selections that then went along with the play, the drama itself, as he then later did for uh, the play Egmont by Goethe 
and others. This was a popular form for musicians in the beginning of the 19th century to have um, their music go along with a, a piece of dramatic work. Not exactly like an opera, but more as uh, music to accompany the play into sort of like a film score. So we have this incredible uh, overture to Coriolan uh, that is in the dark key of C minor, which is of course the key also of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, another wonderful work from this heroic middle period. And the, the overture begins with these very dramatic sort of violent gestures. And that is coming straight out of the mood and the plot of the Coriolan play. Uh, the, the Roman uh, general Coriolanus is uh, in battle and you get the sense of the dramatic tension in the music. And that is contrasted it, with the second theme of this overture, which is the sort of uh, pleading, uh, heartfelt um, music of Coriolanus's mother begging him to not go to battle and to give up his, uh, his military pursuits. So we have this violence and this tension and this drama contrasted with an incredible sweetness. But what runs between all of these themes is an underlying a uh, rhythmic pulse, a drive that is so indicative of Beethoven's uh, middle period and this period in particular. The after the violent chords of the opening, you have this and this this sort of builds and builds and builds with the sweet theme that it comes in the in the in the middle of the overture. This Underneath that sweet theme is still this this running eighth note pulse. And I think that really gives the music its character and its excitement, and you'll hear that. It's an amazing overture. I love performing this piece. It's one of the first works for the full orchestra that I ever conducted as a graduate student, and it holds a special place for me. As with most Beethoven, it's incredibly fun to perform and filled with uh, some wonderful technical challenges for the musicians. That gets us started on this concert and on this 72nd season. Next on the program is the second violin concerto of Sergei Prokofiev. This is the first movement and it will be performed by the senior division winner of our 2020 Young Artists Competition, Lorana Wheeler Roderer. Lorana is a native of Idaho Falls. She has an incredible career going as a violinist. She's a graduate student at the Arizona State University School of Music and has also degrees from a university in Utah in violin performance. And as a, a, a member of the Idaho Falls Symphony Youth Orchestra, she was concertmaster and also concerto competition winner with the youth orchestra competition. So Lorana is now, um, taking violin all the way to its extreme, performing recitals, chamber music performances, collaborating with her colleagues at Arizona State, and is even responsible now for an incredible new work. She co-wrote a uh, opera on themes of sustainability. And we were hearing from her last night in the youth orchestra rehearsal that she is now championing these uh, sustainability efforts uh, through music and charting a course in her career using that as the impetus. It's absolutely fascinating. And she's just a brilliant person, wonderful performer. And we're delighted to have Lorana, who won this opportunity to perform with the Idaho Falls Symphony back in October of 2020. And we haven't been able to feature her until now. So she's been wonderfully patient and we're very grateful for Lorana to perform with us this weekend. We had a rehearsal uh, after she arrived from Arizona the other night and she's sounding absolutely spectacular. The music of Sergei Prokofiev's second violin concerto has a, a, a lot of the, the voice of the composer in his mature form. And by that, I mean it is less abstract and less modern in a way than some of his earlier works. Prokofiev was someone who, when he first came onto the scene, he's born 1891 and lived until 1953. So through the First World War, the Great Depression, the Second World War, he lived through a lot. And of course, in his early days was uh, subject to the um, Soviet censorship and all of the other sort of complex uh, political and um, musical and cultural uh, phenomenon going on in the Soviet Union at that time. But when he first arrived on the scene, it was clear to all around him that this was a prodigy like few others. 
uh, as a pianist. He excelled in his class at the conservatory beyond all others. In fact, he was something of a nuisance to the other students. It's reported that he actually would keep a checklist, a running checklist of the mistakes that his colleagues were making. So not exactly making friends, more or less a, a competitive soul, but a creative genius nonetheless. His early works though are, are very, very modern and very complicated dissonant works for mainly the piano, but also a number of, of chamber music pieces. Just astonishing the, the variety in his piano writing. And it was all music that he played himself and uh, published in, uh, it, for him, mainly for himself to play. A lot of it was considered uh, too challenging for pianists in his day. But he had this gift, and the gift is the voice. And by the time we get to the uh, 1930s, in the Great Depression, he had already uh, made a huge name for himself as both pianist, but also composer and conductor, conducting his own symphonies, of which there are several, and we have performed many at the Idaho Falls Symphony. Uh, to, to try to encapsulate his musical voice, though, in one work is not possible. It's almost as though he reinvents himself and recreates certain parts of his musical personality in every work. Here we are in the 1930s. This is the second violin concerto from 1935. So again, in the midst of the Great Depression, which is impacting concert productions and, and musical efforts around the globe, Prokofiev is back in the Soviet Union now after having lived during the First World War in the United States, uh, being in different countries uh, as an emigre for a number of years, but now back in the Soviet Union. This is the same time period that produced uh, his, probably his most well-known work, especially for our symphony audiences, uh, Peter and the Wolf which dates from 1936. So in that work, for children, you have the sort of simplicity of the music, the characterizations of the different instruments as they relate to the story, um, but still in his particular language, very wide interval leaps, very complex harmonic transitions, and all of that is still sort of part of his music, even in something that's designed for children like uh, Peter and the Wolf. The second violin concerto was written for a very uh, well-known Spanish violin virtuoso who was the individual who premiered the work and traveled with this concerto uh, around the world performing it, uh, lived to be 100 years old. There are some incredible stories of the original violinist. We have tonight the first movement, as is typical for our young artist concerto winners to perform the first movement of a larger concerto. and so. Just having a sample of this first concerto, we get so much from it. The opening gesture is for the solo violin. It's almost like a, a medieval chant or some kind of a, a Russian folk song that opens the work played only by the solo violinist. From there, the orchestra gets involved in the conversation and you, right out of the gates, hear some of the sort of more modern sounds, especially compared to Beethoven. It's going to be quite a contrast in juxtaposition, which I'm looking forward to. I really love those contrasts that we're able to create with our programs. So this, this concerto gets going, the, the orchestra gets involved in the conversation. There are many different moods over the course of the, of the movement itself, even it's, it's sort of like an individual concerto in and of itself, this first movement. The second theme that comes spiraling out of the first is incredibly moving and heartfelt. Has just this beautiful romantic character. And again, straightforward harmonic vocabulary as related to some of Prokofiev's other uh, works which were much less uh, straightforward and tonal where there was a real sense of of harmonic stability now in his music that wasn't there in his in his earlier works so we have Lorana we have Prokofiev truly I, I think this is one of the most colorful concertos and we hope uh, already I've been talking to Lorana we have to have her back and play the entire thing. Uh, I know she's destined for, for great things as a performer and just so excited to have her debut here with the Idaho Falls Symphony. And then after what will probably be a very short pause and a short intermission, we are not sure how intermissions work in the time of COVID, but we'll probably just go basically straight in to what would be the second half and the second symphony of the composer Louise Ferenc. 
Louise Ferenc is a 19th century romantic composer after Beethoven, born 1804 and lived until 1875. And Louise Ferenc, uh, born in Paris, is someone who is virtually unknown. I, over the course of the past year, have been a part of the research process that all of us as performers have been doing, looking into uh, underrepresented composers, women composers, uh, black, indigenous, Latinx composers, making sure that the space is shared, that we have truly representation from all walks of life on our programs, as well as in our audiences and in our orchestras. And it's incredibly important that we have Louise on this opening concert. Never before have we had a woman composer symphony as the second half, the main feature of an Idaho Falls Symphony performance. So it's an historic first. Louise Farring's symphonies come out of her background as a virtuoso pianist. Again, uh, Louise, just like Beethoven and Prokofiev, had uh, an incredibly clear gift as a young person and was taken in by some of the most well-known piano pedagogues in Paris in the 19th century, became a student at the conservatory, and then went on to become a professor at the conservatory, which for a woman was quite unusual in the 19th century. There's an, an important caveat to that though. She was paid less than her male counterparts for several years while she was there and was outspoken against this. And it was only until she had a, a very important performance of her Nanette, uh, a work for nine musicians that included the violinist Josef Joachim, who was a legendary figure, premiered the uh, Brahms Violin Concerto and so much more. After this performance, she had enough of a reputation that she demanded equal pay and she was given equal pay as a, as a woman faculty member at the conservatory. And this is an incredibly important early uh, example of that necessary equality that needs to exist in the performing arts and that fortunately we are getting closer to in the 21st century, but there's still a long way to go. Now, with Louise's music now finally being listened to, performed, and appreciated, we have chamber music by Ferenc that is incredible. There is just an inc a body of chamber music for piano, violin, cello. Again, I mentioned the nonet, there is a sextet, there are some incredible works for small ensemble, as well as her three symphonies and a, a number of overtures, uh, some, of whom, some of which I hope to play uh, with the symphony moving forward. So we have music of Louise Ferenc, again, not a household name like Beethoven, but someone whose music has the same kind of uh, beauty and intellectual complexity and um, depth that a lot of the romantic composers in her generation were known for. This symphony has uh, similarities with the music of Mozart, first of all. It has a very sort of classical clarity to it, but then the length, the concept, the structure is very much like uh, Robert Schumann's symphony is her romantic counterpart, whom she knew and respected, uh, Franz Schubert as well, these great German symphonists whom she was studying and knew and had an appreciation for and was able to not emulate per se, but be a part of that same um, geist, that same conversation that was going on with romantic symphonists at the time. Uh, so Ferenc's second symphony, this is written in 1845. She was already well-known, well-established at the conservatory, and uh, these large-scale works were given their debut in her lifetime, which was noteworthy, again, for a woman composer at the time. And Ferenc also had with her husband a uh, Edition Ferenc, the French publishing house. And so a lot of her music was uh, published in her lifetime, and they were also responsible for 40 years of incredibly important contributions to printed uh, French music literature. So with that, this great second symphony, it's in the bright key of D major, really uplifting from start to finish. And there are four movements in the typical symphonic uh, style. Uh, the first movement has a slow introduction and an allegro, again, sort of borrowing this, the formats from the classical masters like Mozart and Haydn. 
Um, very lyrical second themes, really utilizing the woodwinds. I'll have you listen for that because I think, especially after the absence of the woodwinds last year when we were working primarily with strings, having these wonderfully interconnected woodwind lines is a feature of the symphony and particularly the first movement. It's very broad in scope and some of my colleagues in the orchestra have said that it's long-winded in the way that Schubert is long-winded. He had this famously the heavenly length, this music that has you know great scope and grandeur to it and I think you'll hear that in this music. You'll also hear sort of the early sounds of Johannes Brahms. She preceded Brahms in much of her symphonic output, uh, but that is incredibly significant because clearly this was the way that this type of symphonic writing was going. You know, we've talked a lot in these lectures about the, the uh, dialogue between the so-called new German school, Wagner and Liszt and Berlioz, fascinated by the symphonic poem that represents something that tells a specific story, like Hamlet or the characters of, uh, of Shakespearean plays, versus the pure symphonists like Schumann, Farenk, and Brahms and others who were writing still in the sonata form, very sort of straightforward uh, classical idioms. Frank is part of that side of the conversation. And I think you hear that right out of the gates with this symphony. Again, so much uh, quality of sound, so much beauty in the writing. Some complex things though in the first movement, I just wanna point out there is, the melody is always sort of chasing itself. It has this kind of cat and mouse character where there's, you know, da 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 that one, one is really on top of the other and it creates some beautiful counterpoint. The sort of relationship between the melodies is absolutely fabulous in this first movement. The second movement is the slow movement. It is in the form of a very sort of gentle waltz. And there's some beautiful melodies, sort of a, a theme and variation almost, where the opening theme, ti ha ya tum, ti da ya ba 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 ba. That gets passed between different sections of the orchestra. And as it is passed around, there are secondary themes, again, creating some counterpoint against the first. So the different variations, very, very colorful. Again, there is a moment where the strings completely drop out and the winds have all of the symphonic music uh, provided for them. So it's a wonderful showcase for the members of the Out of Fall Symphony woodwind section. The third movement is a scherzo, a typical scherzo with a sort of a trio section. Uh, a lot of the scherzo, I think, owes its success to the rhythmic vitality. Lots of syncopations, lots of rhythms. I think I'm getting a, a, a freight train going by here, so you'll hear some chiming of the train here. It happened at six o'clock this morning, too, which is always fun. But nevertheless, this scherzo movement, incredibly rhythmical, and the trio part, like uh, Beethoven uh, scherzos, has more of a sort of a pastoral character. There's a very sort of expansive middle section that is folksy and fun, and it really comes across, I think, in especially, again, the dialogue between woodwinds and strings in the middle section. And the finale is a tour de force for the orchestra, a big fugue subject. And that is traded, shared, stretched out, compressed, put on top of itself. It is just an, it's an amazing collection of uh, variations of this different, uh, of this fugue subject. She treats it expertly. It, it's really unbelievable. It reminds me actually of the, the finale of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony, the, the famous five-part fugue. There are moments in this uh, finale of Ferenc's Second Symphony that have that same level of, of architecture, of contrapuntal intensity. It is, it is so fun. Uh, there's some real, again, the cat and mouse, I think is the right analogy because there really are some places where the winds and strings are kind of chasing each other. The brass uh, trumpets and horns in this classical orchestral setup very much involved in creating the power. The timpani is part of the power of the climaxes. And just like the symphonies of Brahms, there's just another great Brahms connection here. One of the things that I love about Brahms is when the music comes back, when you know you have the, the exposition and then the music is developed and the so-called recapitulation is where the music from the beginning returns. And one of the things that Brahms does so uniquely 
later in the 19th century is to have time sort of stand still and have there be this pause before the recapitulation that gives you, I don't know, a fantasy or some kind of moment of clarity before the return of the opening material. And Ferenc does something very, very similar. And again, I think was probably a trendsetter for her time. Uh, there's the music stops, time sort of stands still, and the fugue theme in the oboe is stretched out into this languorous melody accompanied by these bucolic triplets in the other woodwinds. It is a very special moment. So I think you'll hear that. It sort of reaches this climactic point, the music sort of stops, there's a sweet interlude for the woodwinds, and then boom, we're right back to the beginning. The fugue ends with this unbelievably virtuosic coda. Uh, the string players are getting their money's worth here playing the second symphony of Louise Ferenc. I cannot wait to share this with you. I know that some of you are just itching to be back in the concert hall and we will be soon. But for now, I'm so grateful for our executive director, Alexandria Pugh, behind the scenes orchestrating our live broadcast on this Saturday, October 9th. We have a great team with IE Productions, as well as the uh, folks at the Civic Center for the Performing Arts. We're glad to be back. We just are thrilled as an, uh, a group of musicians to be able to perform this great music again as an ensemble and look forward to you enjoying the show. Now, this is the point where I would take your questions. Obviously, not doable. Please reach out to us at ifsymphony.org. Let us know your questions and comments. We would love to hear from you, and we look forward to more concerts as the season goes along. Look out for virtual uh, tickets for all of our shows. It's incredibly affordable, but you can also plan to have in-person seats for the remaining concerts of uh, the 2022 part of the year, and hopefully one or two concerts more in 2021. With that, I will leave you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this sets up what you'll hear musically on our uh, New Beginnings concert. It really is a chance to reconnect with the musicians and the audiences at the Idaho Falls Symphony, finally after these 20 months of being separated. So thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you soon and enjoy.